Welcome back, everybody. It's uh, what is it? Thursday, the twenty third of July. Kind of, uh, kind of bounce around a little bit. I think in this next episode, I want to get the front bumper on. Try to get the stainless steel bumper that I uh, purchased with the rears that I struggled with. Try to get the front on. But before I do that, I want to try to fix some of the gaps that are on the balance down there. I'll show you how that's uh, at least supposed to be done. And then I think I am going to try to revisit the rear quarter bumpers. You know, if nothing else, I spent the money. It's not like I can return them. So I might as well compare to the original bumpers and see what, if any, modifications I can do to the things just to, just to try to get them to fit. Frankly, if I mess them up doing it, so be it. I'm definitely not going to try to sell them to somebody and say, well, I'm getting rid of them because they don't fit. It doesn't work. So we'll go ahead and uh, get to work here and, and continue down the path to, to getting her uh, street legal. Not a whole lot of options with adjusting the front valance here. You've got a connection point up here that screws into the valance, and that's, uh, that's mobile, for lack of a better way to put it. And then you've got another connection point on this just a piece of angle iron. You can see the other bolt kind of comes down in there. But those are uh, adjustable, so you'll be able to get some movement. And then the, uh, this plate here bolts to the valance just to provide it support, but there's not a whole lot of adjustment on that thing. There is some, but not a whole lot. So you can slide the balance uh, front to back, but this one is the one where you're going to be, be uh, bringing it in and all that kind of stuff. So I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and get, get working on this. A lot of iterations of up and down on the bonnet here to make it work, but it shouldn't. Uh, I don't expect this to be too bad. So I got the front bumper on there just uh, at the ends, and it, if, it's, if it's okay, the, the problem, like I have previously pointed out, is for the overriders you've got these clips here that are supposed to fit down in this little groove that's in here and then on these big long threaded rods are in there the originals like this one just had a screw hole and you can see those little clips in there as well so uh, unfortunately this one's got a big old hole in it what I'm going to do is I've, I've already done the left hand side there it's on the workbench I'm going to cut this threaded rod down and see if that helps me right now. It's too long. It goes it goes way back into the into the frame, and I wouldn't be able to get a screw or a nut on there. Uh, and also, these uh, these end bolts don't quite fit inside the hole. The squares of the bumper are a little bit undersized, and they're not letting them fit in flush. So I'm going to try to probably take a file to do that. I don't have any. Uh, any grinding stuff, pneumatic stuff that's that small. So I'll give it a shot with doing that and see if I can't uh, get lucky here. This is a close up of the bumper here with a little square hole. And these are the, uh, the fittings that came with it now. The original ones are a little bit beefier than this, but the holes aren't big enough. So it's not gonna, uh, I'm gonna have to wait, blow out too much of this hole. But I'm using, uh, unfortunately, little jeweler's files. The only thing I have that's square enough to get in there to try to square out this hole. I got a rat tail file, but it's just, it's just going to round out the hole instead of squaring it up. So it's taking a little while, but I got the other one done, so it is working. All right, well, believe it or not. It goes in. All right, so I'll get the uh, get it mounted from this standpoint. I got to cut the uh, the threads back here. See if I can do that real quick. Cut this threaded portion down pretty good. You can see how much as compared to uh, one that came with the original set. The uh, what I'm having to do is essentially put the overrider on first, unbolting the end of the bumper at the uh, the outer wing at the at the far end and then putting this this slot here which you, I know is not really easy to see down inside the problem that I'm having right now is this slot isn't deep enough isn't tall enough to to have the bumper overrider go down far enough to to mate up with the hole so what I'm going to do is just take the grinding wheel or the cutting wheel and just make two more little slits in here so that I can bend this tab back and make it a little bit uh, a little bit bigger. So yeah, not not the not the greatest thing I wanted to do, but it it seems to be coming along so far. All 
All right, so I bet that all the way back. I'm just going to dry fit it onto the uh, bumper or onto the car, see how it works. All right, so I cut the tab back. I showed you that and then also cut it short so that I could get a pair of pliers in there and try to flatten out this bend as much as I could and make it as sharp of an angle as I could. Now I just have it sticking all the way up and I'll show you here how I'm at least managing to get it on. I'm not sure how well this is going to come out, but got that bumper overrider here and what I'm doing is starting to put the threads in first just to get it lined up so I know kind of where I am and then lifting up as high as I can watching the paint getting the I'm gonna pry the the uh, you're gonna pry the fender out or the bumper out a little bit so it doesn't match the paint up on the front mounts get it all the way in until that sits up there and now that looks like it's pretty close to where it is. Grab the camera here. All right, so you can see that tab sticking up and now that's resting pretty much right on top of the, uh, the part of the frame. So all I'm gonna do once I get this bolted in and I'm happy with it, I'm just gonna take a hammer and, and hammer that down and get it a little bit flush. I'm afraid going too far, if I hammer it too much, I'll end up screwing myself a little bit and, and causing it to um, not be able to get out of there at some point in time, but I don't think I'm gonna worry too much about that. So that's, uh, do the other one, do the same thing on the other side there, but I think that's uh, gonna get me at least part of the way there. Well, it's on there, not real pretty, but it's on there. And it's actually uh, kind of sort of fits. Also, you notice that my R is missing there and I do have it, I didn't lose it. But the, uh, the little clips or whatever you wanna call them that hold that stuff on, just from driving the car has loosened most of those up. So I'm, I'm glad that I didn't lose any letters or anything, but uh, I'll have to come up with a better way to secure that or to, or to figure out how to do it properly or something like that. One of the earliest memories I have of working on cars was when I was helping out in my grandfather's garage. Besides holding the flashlight, another thing that I remember vividly is helping him bleed brakes, get in the car, pump the brake pedal a bunch of times, hold it, let it go to the floor, don't let up, all that kind of stuff. So uh, obviously in the interest of getting the safety inspection done, that'll, that'll be coming down the road here. I got to get to make sure the brakes are in good condition. And since I don't uh, normally have a helper over here, I decided to invest in this Mighty Vac system. Best known for bleeding brakes. There's a bunch of stuff, I guess, that this thing will do. Uh, I've never used one. I've only heard good things about them. So we'll see. And I'll, uh, I'll walk you through how I'm going to do this. So there's obviously a bunch of stuff going on in here. So we'll open this up here see all what it comes with. So we've got the, uh, the vacuum pump here, obviously. Uh, this is the cup that's going to hold the brake fluid. Now this is convenient. One, it's graduated so you can see stuff on there. It's got uh, random tubes in here. Also, you can get a feel for how much brake fluid you've sucked out of the system to know that you're not going to drain the master cylinder, which will result in you having to bleed them all over again. So that's kind of nice. Uh, these are little rubber pieces here, and I believe these are to go over the brake bleed nipples. A couple T fittings, another rubber thing, not quite sure what that is. Whole bunch of these uh, random fittings here again, just to, to do different stuff. Bunch of tubing, and then the caps, both a uh, both a permanent or a, a non, you know, a cap to, to seal, and then a cap to allow it to work. So I'm going to go ahead and flip through the instructions real quick, get familiar with what I'm doing here, and then uh, come back and kind of give you a quick rundown. Setup is pretty straightforward. Got the cap for the reservoir. On that cap it says two pump on one side and nothing on the other side. So you can see that this has got a little fitting off the back of it. So the fluid will come in and dump into the pot. And then the other side just vent just into the top into air. So that's what's going to draw the vacuum. So you've got a little inch and a half piece of tubing that goes on the two pump line. The other end of that goes on the pump itself, right, like that. Then you got a little three inch one. Three inch one plugs into the fitting that's on the inside of the cap that is going to go down into the reservoir. The reservoir is just a twist lock reservoir, so that goes in there. Get that relatively tight. And then it tells you to take another piece. You get a couple, a couple of these real long pieces here, 12 inch piece of tubing. That goes on the other end of the cap. And then the appropriate fitting, whatever that's going to be 
for the the brake uh, piece itself. So I, I've got this little piece. I think this is going to work for me. I'm going to be able to fit that right over top of the fitting itself. I'll show you that when I get to the car. And um, that should just be able to mate up here. Got a uh, inline fitting and that hopefully plug one end into there like that and the other end into the hose here like that and hopefully that'll that'll hold vacuum enough. I'm gonna put my finger on the end of that be able to watch it draw a vacuum here. So it's drawing vacuum now on the inside of that tube and I'm gonna pull my finger off. You can hear it. There's also a release down here. This little knob down here is what will allow you to vent it off without pulling it off. A little uh, conveniently put there. And then obviously you can see the gauge here goes from atmospheric down to about 30 inches of mercury. It says it will draw for 25 inches. Get the car up, get it on jack stands, get those rear wheels off, get the master cylinder topped off and, and move on. Now this is the master cylinder, a little dinky thing of course, given the, uh, the size of this, this massive car here. So I, I've got that filled up pretty well, but comparing it to the size of the reservoir, the reservoir is bigger obviously than the master cylinder, but as long as I don't fill the reservoir up more than about half or so, I think I'm going to be good with that. So with the way that um, Triumph recommends bleeding these brakes is essentially you start from the furthest wheel from the master cylinder, so that's going to be the passenger side rear, and then the driver side rear, passenger side front, driver side front. So the, the lighting back over in there is not really great. So I'm going to start on that wheel, but when I come around, I'll show you me doing it on this wheel. Pretty much an extreme close up here inside the wheel well. So this is the brake line coming into the rear brake. This is the bleed screw. This over here is the actuating mechanism for the emergency brake. So all that stuff is uh, looking good here. What I found doing the other side is one that uh, T fitting or the L shaped fitting grips okay, but not great. I would just as soon use the um, the tube directly, so that's what I that's what I did, and just plugging the tube in directly to the bleed screw here. I can get that on there. All right, and it allows me to draw a vacuum. So now, what the procedure says for you to do is connect this up. The bleed screw is still tight. Connect it up like this, or whatever method that you use, and it says to pump to about 10 to 15 times. So I'm going to pump the the uh, trigger here and you can just barely see the gauge in the in the screen one two all right so that's 15 times and I got about 21 inches of vacuum here and it's holding holding pretty steady so that tells me that that tube is sealing pretty well so now that that's done I'm going to just loosen the bleed screw just a little bit until I get some brake fluid flow now what you might see in the tube here is little itty bitty bubbles and that's not necessarily indicative of bubbles in the system but you're going to uh, you obviously have a really low pressure and you're going to suck air try to suck air in pretty hard so if any of this little uh, metal is not perfectly sealing you'll get real real small bubbles here on the other side I had that problem but I drained about uh, a half of the uh, the reservoir the master cylinder reservoir so I'm pretty sure it worked so I'm still about 21 inches or so maybe just a tad less now so I'll go ahead and loosen it and we'll see what we get in the tube doesn't take much all right so you can probably have seen and heard that there is still a little bit of vacuum on there now this tube is filling up with that with air pretty good I dropped down to about three inches of vacuum what I was trying to do on the other side is is maintain a vacuum in here and, and not let it go to atmospheric so I don't suck air back in I, I don't know that that's that much of a concern but you can see those little bubbles forming in there and that's not coming out of the system that's from uh, from it not being perfectly airtight because this bleed screw is tight all right, so we'll go ahead and we'll pump it back up. All right, loosen it. Tighten it up. And it's pretty much just iterations of that, pumping it up, maintaining vacuum on it. Again, it doesn't say you have to maintain vacuum the whole time, but I, but I am until you're confident that you got a lot of that air out of there. So 
that's that's really all there is to it. All right, so I'm pretty confident now that that one's looking good. Again, the little bubbles are just some leakage there because I still have my vacuum on it. Use a little trigger here to let the vacuum out, and you can see the bubbles stop. That's tight. We'll go up to the front. Did the passenger side front wheel. Now I'm on the driver's side front wheel. A couple things I will say. One, I would normally use a flared wrench, uh, but I'm using a regular 7 16 wrench for these because once you get that fitting on, obviously it's you're not going to be able to get a flaring wrench on and off without pulling that off every time, and I don't want to do that. Two, I'm using DOT5 brake fluid for this job for the restoration throughout the clutch and, and the brakes, and that uh, doesn't eat paint. It's got a little bit different characteristics than regular DOT3 or DOT4 brakes. Uh, you cannot use it in anti-like brakes from what I understand, so don't do that. To save my paint, it was definitely worth it going to dot five. So now, same thing, last side, pump it up and uh, get some vacuum in there and then just continue to bleed. This is it's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward, pretty easy. I'm drawing about 20 inches of vacuum or so before I bleed it. All right, getting pretty much continual flow out of that. Master cylinder still got a little bit in there. So I'm happy to where that one sits. And uh, I'll go ahead and vent this thing off and, and take it off. One thing I will note here that I messed up is you can see that little bit of fluid in there. And what had happened was I let this cap fall or the, the reservoir fall and allow essentially the fluid to come up into that portion of the cap. So now I'm sure I've got fluid inside of the vacuum pump. There is screws on this thing. It looks like it's relatively simple to take apart. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do that and clean it. But uh, there's an important safety tip for you. Try to keep that cap upright so you don't suck fluid into the vacuum pump. I was able to take the thing apart, clean it all up. And unfortunately, I, uh, I lost a little uh, circ clip here. I'll have to uh, get one of those. But it is nice because it completely comes apart. So you can totally get in there all except for the gauge i couldn't get the gauge and get it off but i couldn't get it apart to see if there was anything in there so there may still be some brake fluid in there but it felt like i was going to break it if i pushed it any further but this entire contraption completely comes apart so it's very convenient all right so the brakes anecdotally feel better on the, on the pedal pressure uh for those that are regular viewers of my channel you know that uh, i've been working on this car for about four years and any excuse now that that she's uh, mobile under her own power to give her a little spin around the around the parking lot of the uh, industrial park that I am in. I'm gonna do that, so I am going to hook up the battery, get the car started, and uh, go for a quick little spin. I'm not gonna lock up brakes or anything like that, but I'll see, if, uh, see how they feel compared to how they did uh, a couple days ago. All right, well, there's still some sponginess, but uh, it stops. It stops better, but I, I wasn't, I didn't really slam on the brakes, but I wasn't able to lock them up. So uh, other problems are rising. There's a clunk, unfortunately a clunk in the differential, especially coming out of first. Uh, when it takes up the slack, there's a little bit of a clunk. I know I've seen that on the forums before, but people talking about that. I still idles too high. I got the noise in first gear. And if you heard that starting noise when it was starting, I don't, I don't know what that is if the starter is not disengaging from the flywheel 
or uh, or something going on in there. So I, I got to investigate that because that sounds a little bit uh, a little bit nasty. But for the rest of the day, I'm going to take care of the uh, one seat back that I have and get that cleaned up and get that painted. The top rails for the soft top, I'm going to get those cleaned up. I got two of them, one original and one from the black car. The black car one's a little bit better shape. I'm going to get those cleaned up and get those painted today and then uh, hopefully start on passenger seat rear upholstery probably tomorrow. seat back there's these rivets that come through and there's a strip of wood that goes along here if you watched my uh, seat rebuilding video I pointed that out but I got to get these rivets out and they're all kind of rusted and, and they're split really hard to knock back through they're not welded or tacked in or anything so I'm going to just take this uh, sanding wheel essentially grind them flush and then knock them through with a punch and everything I also got a little bit of a crack right here which is uh, on the inside of the seat it looks like so I'm going to uh, clean that up really well and when uh, run a well beat over that too to try to clean that up. But uh, it's not totally through, it doesn't look like. It's not in too bad a shape, so that's good. This stuff here, POR 15, the metal prep. I got this a long time ago when I was first doing the frame. And because there's a lot of nooks and crannies, a lot of pitting and everything in this seat, I'm going to use this stuff. It's a, it's a rust converter. You got to make sure that everything's really, really clean. And then you just kind of spray this stuff on and, and you, you keep it wet for about a half an hour. So I'm going to throw the, uh, the seat frame here in the deep sink and just uh, convert a lot of this stuff over. So you can probably clearly see the crack in the, uh, in the frame right there. So I've got the welder up. Um, uh, Actually, remember to turn the gas on this time, so that's always good. And I'm just going to uh, just going to hit it. Nothing, nothing too complicated here. A little bit of uh, bigger the blob, the better the job, kind of thing. All right. Hopefully that'll do it. I'll just clean that up and get the slag off of there. Again, my welds are not that great, but uh, that should do it. You know, not real crazy with this with this setup here, but that's how I'm gonna have to do it. I don't really have any place to hang and I'm afraid if I put those cheesy hooks in the ceiling, the stuff will just pull out and fall. And I need to have room to get Dorothy back in when I'm done, so. But everything's ready, everything's prepped. I'm gonna go hit, hit it with the two coats of epoxy, black, 30 minutes between each coat. First coat's down, not too bad. Again, this is not a cosmetic job here, this is for you know, especially the seat, this is for uh, rust control. So one coat, 30 minutes here, I'm gonna wait and then get the other one and then that'll be it for the day. As usual, I like to, uh, I like to get out of here after I paint, though it is nice with the garage door wide open and the fan going, it's not, it's not bad in here at all. So I could probably keep working, but nope. Two coats, not too bad. Pretty good coverage everywhere, I'm pretty sure. Now, uh, it's cleared out in here. I'm not worried about any uh, paint residue or anything getting on Dorothy, so I'm going to go ahead and pull her in. Call it a day. All right, everybody, that's all I got. Thanks so much for watching. Leave a comment below and tell me what you think. Well, small steps, but those small steps need to be done. Still, uh, still a lot of stuff to do before I get her to the DMV, but hopefully it'll be soon. So thanks again for watching. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers.